Hey everyone, welcome to week 51. This is day three. This is our ongoing week of black. And we are trying to do paintings where we can emphasize the wonderful value of black pigment. So on Monday, we used black to sort of replace, you know, the blue in what would be a primary color palette. On yesterday, we went like old school illustration, you know, three color palette where we used uh, white, titanium white, cad red, and ivory black. We took that yellow off the palette. And today we're gonna go even smaller. We're gonna explore an even smaller palette. So we'll see how we do. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is gonna be day three. This is Wednesday. This is our ongoing black week. And these past couple of days have been amazing because what we've done is actually taken an interpretation of what a primary color palette would be and replace that blue with black. That was our starting point on Monday. You could argue that that's very close to a four color palette, to a Zorn palette. And that's totally right. That's the type of palette that is usually used to focus in on the fundamental aspects of painting. But that palette, the Zorn palette, usually has only one accent in saturation with the cat red or vermilion or with the bright saturated pigment that you would use in that hue. This is different in a sense because we are also having an accent in saturation with the cat yellow. So there's going to be a broader range of possibilities. Now, why did I do that on Monday? Because one of the things that black is usually accused of and it's usually thought of as responsible for is muddy painting. So if you're trying to darken your colors with black, you're going to get a muddy painting. It's a kind of lazy way of understanding how to darken your colors because you're not really thinking about other options that are available to you, you know, like graying and darkening something with complementaries or using neutral earth tones to do it or using analogous colors to keep the saturation of that hue. The apparently easiest way to darken something is just by using the darkest color in your palette. So by limiting ourselves like we did on Monday to those four colors, we really gave ourselves no other way out. We had to use ivory black if we wanted to achieve darker values, a nice range of dark values that could evoke the hue range of our palette. I don't know if we were going to have access to, let's say, dark yellows, because like we spoke on Monday and we mentioned this yesterday for Spanish Tuesdays, Martes de Español, it is impossible to actually keep that yellow hue and darken it with black without it shifting, without the hue shifting to green. So the fact that we're not able to achieve, you know, all those hues is actually a good thing because we are accepting that, yes, ivory black, in this case, is having a very palpable, very visible effect over the other hues that it's mixing with. And that's totally fine. We just have to be aware of it, aware of the natural limitations that it has, and just almost like work with them, not work around them, but work with those things, empower those things, and more importantly, construct your painting based on those things. Let's not avoid the things that are natural to our palette. Let's actually use them. Let's charge them with energy and not be ashamed of what is going on with the palette. I think that that's one of the most important things when we are tackling these exercises, you know, exercises where we are conditioning ourselves through the choices that we put down in our palette. The fact that we accept those choices is actually a very, very important first step. So I think that introduction on Monday, understanding that black not as a replacement blue. I don't want to give the idea that a black is just, you know, a grayer blue. I don't. I think that it's a beautiful thing when you realize that warmer blacks like ivory black or cooler blacks have a very specific personality. And once they start mixing with every other color in your palette, you start realizing, oh, okay, you know, it can play the role of many things. It can at some point kind of gray colors down it can actually be very cool when mixed with uh, titanium white. It can create very dark, rich colors when mixed with cat red. So there's a beautiful range to the possibilities that it's offering to us. So I don't want to just sell ivory black as a toned down substitute for blue. No, not at all. Not at all. We are just 
putting it in its place so that we can compare the results that we could have with a primary color palette plus white and reflect upon the differences, but also the wonderful qualities that ivory black can bring to the table. Understanding it as a replacement for a primary color palette is just a point of reference. For yesterday, I thought it would be nice if we could start taking colors out of that palette. And I wanted to keep the accent and saturation that I love the most, that it's almost like the natural accent and saturation in my palette, which is in my traditional palette, Cad Red. I know maybe there's a lot of people out there that don't want to use uh, cadmiums, that want a cadmium-free palette. That's totally understandable. There's a ton of pigments that can replace the very nice, rich, bright saturation that cadmium has to offer to us. I use it because it's the color that I've used for so, so long, over 20 years, and I love it. I have a relationship with that color. I'm not trying to be stubborn here, and maybe at some point I have to give it up. But for now, I'm careful enough with Cad Red, and I know that it is a very fundamental part of my palette. So I wanted to keep that accent and saturation, and we obviously kept Titanium White and Ivory Black. Now, this seems like a very, very limited palette. It almost seems like... If I'm describing this palette to you, you almost can envision the things that are possible with this palette. But me coming from an illustration background, this palette is actually a very, I want to say almost traditional palette in like turn of the century illustration, like golden age illustration era. And it obviously had to do also with limitations in printing where there were not a ton of colors available. And eventually it would be extremely expensive to try to broaden those possibilities. But for a very long time, this particular palette was a palette that was used constantly, constantly in illustration. Rockwell used it. Line Decker used it, Saul Tepper used it, Meet Schaefer used it. Some years later, Tom Lavelle used it. It is a palette that you could really, really tie to what we understand as the history of modern illustration. And I've always seen it as such. I've never, ever seen the limitations that should be inherent to that palette. And perhaps I've never seen them because I've always been around these images that these illustrators created that were constructed upon these three colors. So I've seen the broadness of possibilities that can be achieved. And I've always thought, wow, this is not at all a limitation. This is just a beautiful way to work with, again, the options that were available to them in terms of printing. So I loved doing yesterday's painting. For yesterday's painting, it was really important for me to try and evidence the fact that there were all these areas in my palette that I could access. So there are transparent cad reds, which feel very, very bright and saturated. There are cad reds with just a little bit of white. There are cad reds where I'm adding just a tiny bit of ivory black, which gives me a really, really nice broad range in the uh, red hue. And I also wanted to evidence what would happen when the three of them would mix. So what you end up getting is these lighter, cooler, grayer tones, sometimes rosy gray, sometimes more of a purple gray, a violet gray. It was really nice. As soon as those three meet, the range is just very, very subtle, but very, very beautiful. And it just begs to be used. I find a ton of pleasure just using those possibilities when modeling form. Complex forms tend to have so many shifts, they turn so much in space that all those turns are just possibilities for us to equate them to mixes in our palette. And I love to do that. Um, I also did something a bit more expressive and a bit more open, but I think it suited the image perfectly, which was to leave the hands open. I thought that by just enunciating the shape, the outer shape, the contour of those hands, there was something very nice. There was something that seemed like a ritual was taking place in this painting. It just seemed like there was a pause in time, this almost like offering. And I think that the hands were actually pivotal to that sensible quality of the painting because that was not my original intent. I just stumbled upon it and I thought it was really cool and I was like okay I'm gonna keep this this is definitely making it to the final image um, those moments are scary because I naturally tend to want to develop things that's the painter that I am and if it has to do with form I'm always like oh I want to turn that form in space like that it's my bread and butter like that's something that I love to do so for me to say I'm gonna leave this shape open I'm gonna leave this form open I want air to breathe in this shape. I want the eye of the observer to land here and kind of rest. You know, I, I really think that paintings need those moments. I mean, it's not absolutely necessary, but I like that. I like that rhythm uh, in painting. 
for me, it's weird. For me, it's it, it almost goes against my instinct to let myself solve, you know, specific areas of a painting in this manner. So I think I'm going to do that a little bit more during this year. Just grant myself the right to say, hey, you would usually solve this in this way. Why don't you try something else if you are feeling it? If you're sensing that this can work in a painting, just let it go and, and do it. Give it a shot. I want to pump myself up, you know, during this year and, and tell myself that there's so many places that I haven't explored within my painting, within my own sensibility. I don't have to become other painters, but this is within the person that I am that for unbeknownst reasons to me, I just don't explore. Probably fear being the uh, biggest reason behind my hesitance, but I want to give myself the chance to just do it. And if it doesn't work out, it didn't work out. It doesn't matter. You know, it's a painting. And tomorrow we'll do another painting and we'll try something else out. And I hope that those moments that don't work out that well don't become a deterrent. And I don't view them as these obstacles that I can't pass. No, I want to feel that frustration, but I also want to feel that by giving myself the chance to do something that doesn't quite feel comfortable, I'm also going to be able to explore new territories for my painting. And that's super, super exciting to me. So that was yesterday. For today, you guys have probably noticed it by now, we eliminated the accent and saturation. So in essence, we are working with two colors, black and white. That's it. We're doing like a monochrome painting. Now, here's the wonderful thing about working on paper, specifically on a paper that has some tone to it. And I have to say, the moleskin paper that I'm painting on tends to be a little bit yellow, like a creamy yellow. It's very nice. It's a beautiful, beautiful color. Because we are working on that paper, that paper is going to become our third color. You know, this is inevitable. If we are working on a toned surface, we actually have to acknowledge that that is also a color that that is going to play a role in our painting, in our final image, even if we want it or not. We can't just say, oh, this is a black and white painting and that's it. No, we have to be aware of the character that our surface has. And in this case, I think it's very evident. And even though I'm going to try to make the majority of this painting be about just black and white pigment, titanium white and ivory black, there are going to be areas where my instinct is going to tell me, oh, don't touch this. This looks really, really nice. And it gives a sense of richness and it expands the hue range that is available to me in the painting. So it's almost like we're cheating a little bit, but we're not because those are the natural conditions of the tools that we're working with. And if those possibilities are there, we're not breaking the rules. We're not doing anything weird or foreign to the act of painting. We are just naturally constructing a painting and letting things be in some areas. So even though we sacrificed a hue by taking away the cat red from the palette, we're also being highly conscious and highly sensitive to the fact that that surface, that paper, has a tone to it. And if it has a tone to it, we're going to use it. I think today, if we're working on this subtractive manner, where we started with a four color, somewhat pseudo primary color palette, and for yesterday, in our case, we took away the uh, cadmium yellow, and then today we take away the uh, cad red, it's almost like the painting experience is not going to be revelatory. It's not like we're going to learn something incredible about ivory black that we weren't really feeling on the first couple of days. It's just that today it's going to be a lot more evident. And what do I mean by evident? I think that the warmer nature of ivory black when it's transparent and it can have, you know, that beautiful tone of the paper just shine through that transparent layer, it speaks of a very rich, almost velvety possibility that is available through ivory black when it's transparent, when it's treated transparently. I think that that warmness starts immediately subsiding when you start mixing with titanium white. And you realize you know, the powerhouse that titanium white is, it is so, so strong. It imposes itself so much over other colors. I mean, there's crazy colors out there. There's saturation that's unimaginable and unmanageable <laughs> even with a bunch of other pigments. And what's clear and evident about the mix of these two is that there is this wonderful coolness that you can access when the two of them mix together. It's not quite neutral. I'm, I'm going to say that it actually leans towards the cooler side, which is very weird because ivory black, when compared to other blacks, it's actually a little bit warmer. That's where that velvety sense comes in. But as soon as you touch it with titanium white, 
oh my god, it becomes very, very cool. Now, different result if we were using a warmer lead white to do the mixing. So it's a great opportunity to remind myself that, you know, even though these two colors are coming together, it doesn't mean that there's just one possibility, that there's just this one grayness that is resulting from the meeting of these two colors, of these two beautiful colors. No, not at all. There are so many options available to us that it's crazy. It almost feels like exploring a painting through the color. I'm super aware of what I'm saying here. Through the color that it's available when using, you know, a white and a black. In my case, a titanium white and an ivory black. It's a wonderful exercise. It really teaches your sensitivity to start to be very, very aware of changes in temperature. And obviously, it's a perfect exercise to emphasize your values. We can concentrate on the way we construct the painting, on you know the way we put down our brush strokes. So this is a beautiful way to investigate painting. And by the way, this is not just an exercise. If you look at Sophie Jodoin, and I think we've spoken about Sophie before, Sophie is one of the greatest draftspersons in, I think, contemporary art. I think she's just a beast. I mean, she is an incredible draftsperson. And Sophie, for the longest time, was working monochrome. She was even painting with gesso was white, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, she was doing a ton of like amazing, more expressive exercises with paint. But what she achieves with these very limited options, it's just remarkable. I mean, there was never a moment in my looking at some of her drawing, paintings, however you want to call the meeting of these two manners of expression, there was never a moment where I thought, oh, wow, this is lacking. I wish there were some hues in here. Not at all. Not at all. And I've always said this, but I think the mark of a great, great work of art is when you don't need anything else, when everything that it has to offer to us is there. And the limitations can be plain to see, but you don't yearn for anything that's outside of the painting, that's outside the rules that this painting is proposing to you. We become firm believers in what the work of art is preaching, and we're along for the ride. So I think that for my self-portrait today, I, I can't access the incredible ability that Sophie has, but what I can do is just try and have fun with the expressive possibilities that are, you know, right there in front of me. And I loved it. I would work with, you know, black and white for the rest of my life. If somebody wanted to punish me, like jokes on them, because I would never feel like I'd be missing anything if I had to work with black and white. So this was a beautiful opportunity to start from a primary color palette where we were trying to understand the personality of black just by associating it with blue. And then we said, no, there's this richness and this coolness that is there. Why don't we use it with cat red? Why don't we use it with a bright accent of color? So let's eliminate cat yellow, let's keep cat red. And then today is like, okay, let's eliminate that very bright saturated spot in our palette. And let's just concentrate on these two gorgeous, again, powerhouses of pigments meeting each other. And of course, the meeting is just mind-blowing. So again, by slowly subtracting variables from our starting point on Monday, we are now looking at black and saying, you are a color. I was working with four colors on Monday. Yesterday, I was working with three. Today, I'm working with two. Two colors, two pigments that have personalities. That very much so makes some colors in my book. So uh, that's going to be it for today. For tomorrow, we are actually going to concentrate on an aspect of black that I think it's almost like instinctual and I think it's part of its nature and it's almost unavoidable. I think I'm going to treat it in a very subtle way tomorrow just so that it's not overkill, but I think it's going to be a very, very cool exercise. But that's tomorrow. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Bye.